um, and we're talking about CVs, um, especially CVs related to um, defining your second career or career change. Um, my name's Richard. I, I'm an employment and careers advisor here at Work Avenue. So nice to meet you all. Um, there's a fair bit to cover within the hour. So um, appreciate you're going to have your questions. Um, as usual, uh, please put your questions in the chat or um, put your hand up and Yael will um, have a look out for you um, and you can ask your question. Um, there might be some time at the end as well for questions. So we'll see how we get on with everything. So if I could ask everyone to just stay on mute um, uh, th th for the duration, unless of course you're asking a question, uh, then that would be great. Um, so let's begin. I'm going to open up the slides. Um, there's still people coming in, but I guess they'll just have to start um, midway through if, they're, if, if we've already started. So... Um, Can everyone see that okay? No? Oh. Yeah, Al, can you see that okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, great. Okay, great. Um, so we're gonna be talking about CVs, as I said. Um, now, um, a few things to mention at the start when, when we're referring to CVs is that, first of all, I don't claim to be the authority on how to write a CV, and none of us do here at Work Avenue. Um, in fact, you know, there's lots of different thoughts and theories on how to do the best CV. Um, I suppose I'll just give you the benefit of my experience of having written hundreds, probably thousands of CVs over the years. Um, and uh, but, but of course, you know, at the end of the day, you've got to do what's right for you. Um, so, um, there's lots of diff there's, there's different types of CVs. Okay. Um, now we're, we're going to look at that. We're also going to look at how you match your CV to the jobs that you're applying for. Um, and of course we're going to make sure, um, that your, your CV looks as good as it can be. So hopefully I'm going to give you my thoughts on, on those things. Those are the main things that we're going to be looking at today. Um, so first of all, types of CVs. Well, um, there's two main types of CVs. The first one is the chronological, um, which really should be called reverse chronological. And it basically um, outlines your CV in a reverse chronological order. So, uh, for example, for the employment section, um, your, your CV will go from your most recent job down to your, your last job. Um, and same with the education um, and the other sections of your CV as well. Um, it's the most common type of CV, the chronological CV. Um, I would say probably in, in my experience, 90 or 95% of people that um, write CVs usually write a chronological CV. It's the one that employers are expecting to see when they, when they see a CV. Um, it's just generally the most, the, the, the most often used CV out of the two. Um, You've also got the functional CV, which um, I think someone sort of started and coined the phrase about 20 years ago. And often the functional CV focuses on, mainly on the skills. Um, and it's usually when people have, for example, got big gaps in their um, career history, um, or they've had lots of little jobs or, or intermittent jobs, or perhaps they've had lots of voluntary work, but not so many uh, paid work experiences. That's when um, sometimes we use the functional CV. Um, if I'm honest, I'm not a big fan of it. Um, and the main reason I'm not a big fan of it is because employers simply aren't expecting to see it. Um, so appreciate sometimes it's, it, it's the most useful for someone to use and it's the best one for someone to use. But in most cases, I'll try and when I'm working with someone one to one on a CV, I'll try and talk them out of using a functional CV if we can. Um, and that's mainly because employers simply aren't expecting to see it. And if they've got if an employer has, let's say, 20 CVs in front of them or 50 CVs in front of them and and 95 percent of them are chronological, and only one or two of them maybe are functional, then they might smell a rat. They might wonder, well, why are these CVs different from all the rest of them? And 
they don't tend to look on that favorably. Um, so that's that's why I usually recommend the chronological. Now, sometimes you can't avoid it. So if you've had, like I said just now, if you've had long periods of unemployment, you might not be able to avoid it. Um, so if that's the case, then um, then, of course, a functional skills CV, you know, you can use it and it can still look very good. So um, I'm, I'm not trying to say don't use it, um, but I, I think, you know, generally speaking, if you can, then I would try and use a chronological CV. Um, right, let's move on. Uh, so the, ma the main point really here is whether you're using a chronological or a functional skills CV is to make sure that it matches the job that you're applying for. So shortly, we're going to look at an example job um, description so that we can get a sense of, um, of how you can match your CV to the job you're applying for. Um, it's really, really important. Imagine, uh, like I said, an employer's got 50 CVs to look through. Um, and so often with CVs, you, say, you see the same type of things. You know, I'm hardworking, I'm confident, I'm enthusiastic, um, I've got lots of skills, I'm a great person, I'm, I'm honest. I'm, you know, you, see, you tend to see all, all those sort of generic terms, you know, in a CV very, very often. So what we say at Work Avenue um, and, and how I help people write CVs is to make them as specific as you can to sell you for the job you're applying for. So those generic terms, whilst it's OK to use them a little bit in a CV, we, we'd much rather show you how to focus your CV and make it specific to sell you for the job you're applying for. And, and I'll come on now to show you um, to, to show you how to do that in a moment. Um, just one or two things quickly before I move on. Um, if you don't have a job description, and it's often the case, uh, sometimes you might just see, you know, Facebook, you might be on a Facebook job group and they might just say, my husband's looking for X or my company's looking for Y. Uh, you know, accounts assistant or administrator, and there might not be any job description. It might just say, please send your CV through to this person. Or maybe you've, you've just seen a job advertised and there's a very, very short description. If that's the case, then my advice is to look at other similar jobs. So if it's, let's say it's accounts assistant, go online, find two or three similar um, grade level account assistance roles and find a full job description or person spec for that and use that to help you write your CV. Um, so here is, a, here is a typical job. The reason we've used this one for this workshop is because we're gonna show you a CV shortly of how I help someone to transition from one career to another career. And in this case, and we'll come on to see it shortly, it, 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 it was a client of mine that, that wanted to transition from being a teacher to working in fundraising or in charity events, that type of thing. So what we thought would be a nice idea, because it was actually a good success story, this, this client actually did transition from being a teacher to being a fundraising manager with one job. Um, so it was a, a really good success story. So that's why we decided to use it. Um, so, so I'll come on to show you the CV shortly. Um, so here you've got the job uh, the job advert that we that we actually I think this might have even been one that we had on our website um, and you can probably see as you read through it that there's certain buzzwords so things like um, fundraising strategy um, it mentions targets um, uh, you know all the generic things you expect to see within a fundraising job in a charity networking um, vit uh, written and verbal communication skills marketing, social media, strategy, events. And out of all that wording on that page, those are the main specific things. So what I did was I worked with my client to make sure where possible she could get some of these, some of this terminology into her CV, into the most sort of influential, the, the best parts of her CV, so that when the employer reads it, they, they can immediately notice and immediately be in the operative word, because I don't know if you know this, but on average, um, an employer spends less than a minute looking at a CV. So not only do you have to get these, these buzzwords and uh, you know th these points into your CV, you have to get them into your CV in such a way that the, the employer is going to recognise them quickly. Um, and we'll come on to talk a bit more about that 
um, shortly. Um, so yeah, those are the main words I, I picked out from there. Um, if we now go for, go through and, and look at the CV, you'll see how it's been tailored to the role. Uh, by the way, um, just for the purposes of this workshop, we um, we just used the first page of this CV. On the second page, you've got uh, more of the jobs. Now, um, I've given you a bit of a background to this CV. Um, as, as I said, the, the client was a teacher and she wanted to transition into fundraising. Now, she did have a big added advantage that, that, um, to, to do that. And that was she was in her spare time the trustee of a charity. Um, so it's a little bit of a cheat. She did have experience, although she didn't have any paid work experience. Um, she did still have experience nonetheless. She had quite had a few years. I think when we wrote this, it might have been 2019. So she'd had two or three years working as, uh, sorry, in, in her spare time. And, and I only mean a few hours a week, believe it or not. May, maybe when there was a big event, she might have had a few more hours sort of, you know, it might have been a bit more busier, but she really only had sort of a few hours experience in this a week. And and I, I just want to emphasize, just slightly coming off the topic of CVs for a second, the, the, the importance that if you're changing career of volunteer, volunteering, I think David Kaplan even mentioned in his, um, in his keynote speech this morning that when he was transitioning from, um, from uh, United Synagogue to, uh, to, to forming his own business and moving moving on in his career. Um, he did some work experience, some voluntary work. So I, I can't emphasize enough, and it's something that we talk about quite a lot here at Work Avenue. Um, so yeah, so in a way, this was sort of cheating. It wasn't that she had no experience in, in going into fundraising and events, because she did. But what we did was, she when I, when I first met her, she didn't have virtually anything about her fundraising experience on her CV. She had a small section at the bottom of her CV in volunteer volunteer work and just happened to mention. Um, now, I don't know if you know this, but employers spend the vast majority of their time on the first page of the CV. So actually things that are sort of hidden down at the bottom, bottom of the second page or in some people's cases, the third page or fourth page, which we which we don't advise doing. We don't advise going past two pages. Um, but the point is all the juicy stuff of your CV, the stuff that's gonna sell you for the job you're applying for should be on the first page. So what I encouraged her to do is to put it into the career summary. So we called it career summary. You know, I notice this often with, with clients, they're, they're worried about putting voluntary work within the main body of their employment history. Well, we called it career summary and I, I suggested she puts it as the top job. Um, she was actually still teaching at the time so she could, she, uh, uh, when I first saw her CV, she had all her teaching roles first and then volunteering down at the bottom. And I encouraged her to put the, the fundraising and events manager, um, which by the way, is a job title we came up with, even though she just called herself trustee. Um, we, I encouraged her to put it on the first page of her CV in her career summary, because I think that's what employers spend most of their time on. Don't forget, it's only less than a minute that they're spending looking at a CV. So you need to have all the good stuff on the first page. You'll also notice here in the key skills that we've got some of the, um, so, so some of the um, skills that she's got that are gonna sell her for the role she's applying for. So if we just go back to um, the job description, like I said, you've got things in here like networking, written, written and verbal communication skills, strategy, social media marketing. So what we did was we took these skills and we made sure that it was really clearly described in the key skills section. And then, of course, in the career summary section under fundraising so that immediately the employer would pick it up and notice that she's got those skills. And not only the skills, but you can see there if you read, I hope it's clear enough on your screens, but you can see if you read that there's also outcomes and successes from, from those skills. Um, so that's that's kind of how we um, how, how I would recommend writing a CV. And we're gonna actually look in a little bit more detail of some of these specific parts of the CV. Um, one thing to add, um, is you might have noticed that um, 
that when we talked about the different types of CV, the functional skills CV has mainly focusing on the skills and the chronological CV um, mainly um, looks at all of the employment history and education in reverse chronological order. You might have noticed that actually this CV has got a little bit of both. This is almost like a hybrid CV because um, it's also got a section on key skills. And I thought this was going to be most beneficial to this client, given that she's changing career. So I think this is a, a pretty good recipe for how to, to, to write a CV when you've got transferable skills that you're taking from one job into the next job, which could be a different career. Um, just quickly before we move on, how are we doing? Have, have, we, have questions been coming through? I haven't been looking at the chat yet, Elle. No, no questions at the moment. Oh, must be, must, must, must be so screen obvious, screen. must be so clear and obvious what I'm saying that no one needs to ask any questions. Um, keep you're an eye out. Yeah, keep an eye out as well for people that might put their hand up. I know it's not easy to see um, when you're sharing the screen, but um, if anyone's got any questions so far, then obviously please ask as we go along. Um, the next point, the next um, thing we're going to look at quickly is this is a chronological CV, but I'm going to look briefly at how you might do a functional skills CV when you're applying for a job in a, you know, when you're changing career. Um, and I think this can be really good if you if you are going to use it, because what you can do is, as we highlighted and we're still going to stick. I'm still for the purpose of this argument. I, I do have to apologize, but we didn't have the equivalent functional skills CV for someone going from teaching into fundraising. We just haven't had that as a, an example. So for the purpose of this, we actually this was actually for an administrator. Um, but all the same points apply. You're listing your main skills that are going to sell you for the job you're applying for. So I suppose what we would do is if you can see the key skills here in the chronological, which are communications, event management, grants management, marketing management, etc. You can then put them in a little bit more detail into the um, into the skills section of your functional skills. So you can actually see that there's more emphasis on expanding on these skills in the functional skills CV than there would be in in the chronological CV. Um, and that's, I suppose, diverting the employer's attention away from the perhaps the fact that you've got gaps in your CV um, or you've had lots of short term jobs and mainly focusing on the skills you have that are going to sell you for the job. Um, so Richard. I know. Yeah. Oh, sorry to interrupt. There's just no, a, that's good, a good timing. Question. Um, the first question is about how to account for gaps in a CV. So uh, Natalie's asked for a career break of a couple of years, for example, maternity leave, or it could be any other reason for taking a gap. How, she says, how am I able to circumvent this in the CV? Well, um, I, I agree with Amanda Rubin. So I, I imagine... Um, Law of averages, probably half of you were in, in the last session with Amanda Rubens. But for those of you that weren't, she said, keep it short and sweet. Don't go into lots of detail. Um, you know, don't sort of say, you know, I, I took time off to look after a sick parent. Um, they were really ill and it was difficult and I had to stay around at their house a lot and I didn't have a chance. to. So you don't want to go into lots of detail. The it, it, You're only sort of digging yourself a deeper hole because ideally having a career break isn't the isn't great to have on your CV. Now, it's much better to have one than just to leave it blank. Because if, if, for example, from 2016 to 2018, you've got nothing on your CV, then the employer's going to wonder why. And they're probably going to come to the worst conclusion, which is you spent two years looking for a job unsuccessfully. And they're probably going to think to themselves, well, if no one else wanted them, then why should I have them? And, and look at it badly. So it is definitely worth putting a career break. I highly advise you do it, but just don't go into a lot of detail about perhaps you were off for maternity leave or, or you had some difficulties. Don't go into a lot of detail about it. Um, the other thing that I would highly recommend is that in this short section of your CV, if you are going to put it, then I, I would I would perhaps put any voluntary work you did, you know, show that you're You've been very proactive, even though you had to take two years out or a year out or however long it might be. Show that you were proactive. So 
maybe you did some voluntary work or maybe you did a course um, or maybe you helped a friend out with his business you know show that you you're you're a very sort of proactive vibrant type of person great thanks richard i think camilla did you have a question you wanted to ask so you raised your hand but not on the chat but you don't have your camera on so if you want to ask you want to unmute and ask you got five seconds, otherwise I'll move on. Ah, yeah, oh. it's there. Oh, okay. One second, the question is, um, Camilla's been at home for more than a year with her child. She's considering opening a business to work from home. How should she update her CV? I think you've probably- That's um, ans I've answered that. Covered I? that. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Another question is, someone says, should someone take risks in their uh, personal statements or um, what you write on your CV in order to attract attention? It's, it's a very good point. And in fact, I was working with a, a client recently and um, she said to me, she said, because I sent her through a sample CV and she said, oh, it was a bit boring. You know, um, she said, oh, it's just like, you know, just probably similar to the, these ones that we're looking at now. And she sent me one back that was like completely wacky with loads of color on it and a photo on it. And, you know, it was a completely unorthodox way. And I suppose that's the kind of thing you're talking about, taking a risk or maybe putting things on there that that could be a bit risque, you know, the content that you put on there. Look, um, it, it is a personal thing. And I, I, I couldn't say, I mean, certainly for, for industries such as graphic design or creative jobs, you know, maybe you're, you, you know, you've, you've got a wacky job that you're applying for, then I suppose, yeah, they're looking for your creativity. They're looking for sort of a, a risque kind of approach, or maybe it's kind of a, a sales, salesy sort of CV, and you're looking to show that you're a creative salesperson and therefore using um, different content to do that. But generally speaking, if it's just for a standard type of job, like an accountant, a lawyer, an administrator, a project manager, or like all the mainstream bulk of jobs that you see out there, I would say probably not. I, I would just sort of stick to, to, to what's going to sell you best for the role um, because employers might, you know, at the end of the day, you're dealing with people and everyone's got a different opinion. I think more often than not, most employers or recruiters looking at the CV are going to are going to want the traditional approach. So I think you have to go go for the what the majority of people are going to like to see. Um, great, Richard. Sorry, one. There's a couple of questions about career changing on CVs. Mm -hmm. One of them is, um, is it a good idea to summarise why you're changing career on your CV, or should you leave that for your cover letter only? So. Um, yeah, I, th I think I think it's it's whilst it's whilst it's good to do that. Yeah, I think it is more of a probably more for the cover letter to do that as the reason why you're changing career. But actually, truth be told, you you almost want to give them the impression that you have already started making the transition for changing career anyway. Because if you tell them I, the reason I want to change into this career is X, Y, and Z they're going to think, well, they don't know anything about this career then because they've not perhaps done any voluntary work or, or, or done any courses or anything like that. Whereas if you've done a course and you've done some voluntary work, then arguably you've made the transition already. The employer is going to be more comfortable that you're a good match for the job because they don't really want someone that's got no knowledge or experience. And I suppose by you telling them that you're you're looking to, to change career for X for, for reasons X, Y, and Z, they're going to probably assume that you don't really have any experience then. So, you know, you almost want to tell them that you have already transitioned and therefore you don't need to explain it because you've already done it, if that makes sense. Shall I move on or right. any Thanks. other questions? And there's a question about a more... There's one question about a more extensive um, career break. So if somebody's been out of workplace for a while, they haven't really done um, voluntary work or training or courses like you described before that they can um, put onto their CV, how would they account for that or address a longer gap on the CV? Okay. Um, who asked that question? Does it say? That is Naomi Shear. 
Sorry? Yeah. I didn't hear what you said. Naomi Shear. Oh, okay. Naomi Shear. Okay. Naomi. Naomi Shear. Naomi. Oh, Naomi Shear. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, it's a difficult one because, um, you know, if you've got a very long gap, it depends how long the gap is you're talking about. You know, I suppose if it's, you know, two years or less, then I suppose it's okay. Even if you haven't done any voluntary work, you can just put a short statement as long as it's positive as to why, you know, the reason why you've had a career break. If it's 10 years, five years, 10 years, or even more than that, then I suppose arguably you'd be looking at the functional skills CV if you haven't done anything in that time. Um, so I, I suppose then you don't really have, to, there's not as much emphasis on that because you'll be filling most of it with the skills, like you can see on this CV that we're looking at on the on the slide now. So there's, there's not much. Um, yeah, you really want to sort of um, not bring any employer's att intent attention to that. Um, another thing to think about is if your career gap was, let's say, 10 years ago. So let's say from 2020, sorry, sorry, from 2000 to 2010, let's say that was the period where you were bringing up kids and you had a, a, a you know, you, you, you took 10 years out as you were bringing up three or four children. And since then, you've done voluntary work and courses and you've put in paid employment and that sort of thing. So in other words, from 2010 to 2020, you have been active. Then I would just not go any further back than 2010. And then you don't have to even explain any of it. The employer just is quite happy that you've just put on your CV the last 10 years of your um, of your career history. So that, that's that's sort of what I would do there. Um, Richard, there's one more question, but I think you might be moving on to it now, which is if somebody is moving to a new career, should they put the a job title CV to show that they match? Um, yeah, Elle, you broke up there for a minute. I didn't hear that. Can you repeat it? Oh, sorry. The question is for somebody changing career, should they put the new career job title or part of the job spec into the profile on their CV? Yes. Um, if, it, you know, in fact, we're going to come on to talk about that. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we're going to talk about the profile. So uh, we will answer that shortly. Uh, so that's the functional skills CV. We've looked at the chronological and the, the two types of CV, the chronological and the functional skills CV. So just a few things on the profile. The profile is, can you see the, the, the top few sentences there that you've got on, on both CV? So we recommend it, whether you're doing a functional or chronological, we recommend having a profile at the top. Um, the main reason we recommend having the profile goes back to the amount of time an employer spends looking at a CV. Um, I do see CVs often without profiles, and I think it's a mistake because you really do, in that minute or less than a minute, the employer's looking at your CV, you really do want them to get you immediately and not just get you, but really be confident that you can do the job. So I see a lot of profiles that write, you know, I'm a hardworking, I'm a professional person, I've got good IT skills and all this kind of stuff. So anyone that reads it still has no idea what you want to do or what your expertise is. OK, so my advice is to make sure that you have a career objective in there. Uh, to make sure that you use, like, I suppose, really, if you had to sum up um, yourself in 10 seconds. So it's like almost like a 10 second elevator pitch. For those of you not familiar, an elevator pitch is the time it takes from you to go from one floor to, let's say, the fifth floor in an elevator with someone that you want to sell yourself to. You, you've got the time it takes for those five flights in, in the elevator to, to sell yourself to that person. So it's like, 10 seconds, 20 seconds. So my advice would be for the profile mm -hmm. to be like your 10, 20 second elevator pitch where you sell yourself for the job. So you can include a career objective and maybe one or two points that are gonna, uh, uh, are very important to the employer. So let's say the employers put on their um, job description that the most important thing is that you've got good networking skills or good sales skills, then you might put, you know, um, a highly experienced salesperson with excellent networking and relationship building skills. Um, and then immediately the employer 
just from the very first sentence thinks, wow, you know, this, this is the sort of person we're looking for. So you, you immediately start really high in their expectations, which is a great place to start uh, when an employer starts reading your CV. So that's what we sort of say about the profile. Um, must be targeted the, to the job you're applying for. Um, here's a couple of examples. OK, now. The first example here will answer the question. Who, who was it that asked, asked the question? Uh, yeah, Elle, that we're going to cover. Now. That we're was cover. Lynn. Lynn. OK, so this should answer your question, Lynn. Even if you haven't got any experience in the uh, career that you're going into and therefore the job that you're applying for, you can you can you can be clever. And you can actually, rather than saying you're experienced in it, you can say that you're knowledgeable and passionate or enthusiastic about that industry. And a case in point here, the very first example here of a profile, I helped a client write and we did it. This person had no experience in property management at all. Uh, I told him to go away, do loads of research, speak to people, connect with people in property management on LinkedIn and really find out everything he can about about property management, even maybe get some work experience in it. I told him to do all of that. Then he came back to me after having um, sort of researched the industry quite well, spoken to people. And I said, right, now you're ready to put on your profile that you're knowledgeable and passionate about property management and you're not lying. Um, but an employer reads it very well because actually it, it's, it kind of infers that he has got experience in property management even though he hasn't, because you've got the word experience there in the first sentence. So it's, it's, a, it's sort of a clever little trick um, to, to, to be able to include the career that you're going for in, in, in the profile. So that, that's the first one there. The second one there, I also helped someone write. And this person has got, uh, believe it or not, uh, a whole career in marketing, but was a bit outdated. Sort of the guy, the guy I think was in his 50s and or 60s and had lost touch with uh, uh, sort of how much digital marketing had progressed. So um, he was of an old school marketeer, um, whereas he wasn't familiar with terms like SEO and pay-per-click and all the modern digital marketing terms. Um, and actually, once, uh, we, we after a long chat, we decided it'd probably be good for him to go into sales because he also had a, a, quite a bit of experience in sales, even though his main experience was in marketing. So that's how we wrote this profile highly experienced and award-winning sales manager. Well, he really, really is a marketing manager, but but we've, we've added the caveat with significant marketing expertise. So the main emphasis there is on the sales management, which was the job he was applying for and not the marketing. Um, it's often a mistake people make. Some people write a profile and use that same profile for every job they apply for. And it's a mistake. You, you have to sell yourself for the job you're applying for each time. You know, if this guy had had also applied for marketing roles, having said that he's a highly experienced and award winning sales manager, well, he's missing a trick there because actually his main experience is in marketing. So I would have suggested to him to change that to a highly experienced and, and competent, even if he wasn't award winning, maybe marketing manager. Um, so, so that's how you do the profile. That's how I'd recommend doing it. Um, just, just a couple of added points. Um, you know, you can use phrases like proven track record in or experience of um, ability to, it's quite good. Um, don't, don't make the mistake some people make of putting that you've got, you know, let's say you're a mature candidate and, and you put that you've got 30 years experience in a sector because actually whilst you think it looks good, it may not look good. You know, if the employer's got an idea in their mind that they're looking for someone, let's say, in their 30s or 40s, and you and you put that you've got 30 years experience, they're probably going to put you at 50s or 60s, and therefore you might not get the interview. So in, in that case, I would try and stick to words like extensive experience or substantial experience or things like that. Um, On that note, Richard... There's been a question, how far should somebody who's got more extensive career history go back on their CV? OK, it's a good question. Um, and to be honest with you, this is a case by case basis. I, I don't think this rule applies to everyone. But generally speaking, 
we say to go back about 10 or 15 years on a CV, maybe 15. Sometimes I don't mind seeing 20 years on a CV because that sort of puts you in your 40s. But you don't want to go back to, to right to the beginning of your career if you're a mature candidate. So, um, you know, I had a client the other day that that's career started in 1969 and he had that on his CV, believe it or not, right near the top of his CV. So he, he actually had it in chronological order instead of reverse chronological order. And that immediately sort of kind of sets you off on a bad start there. Um, does that answer that question? That question was from Janine. So if you have any follow up, you can put it on the, on the chat. So it is a case by case basis. I don't think there's a one rule of fit. One rule applies to all there. And, and if you get in touch with an employment advisor and we, we look at either myself or one of my colleagues and we look look um, at your CV in detail, then I suppose that's the best way to do it. But generally speaking, we don't suggest going back too much further than 15 years. Mm -hmm. OK, so we're going to look a little bit at the careers history. The career history or the key skills so um if, if i just show you with the um with the chronological cv you can see there that there's the start of the career summary there some people call it employment history some people call it work experience um and on the i know you can't see it on the functional skills cv here because we've only got the first page up but on the second page of this cv it literally lists the jobs so there's no information under each job. It just literally lists them. Um, so, you know, I think this one was a lawyer. Um, so, you know, lawyer, the name of the company and the dates they work there without any real detail or bullet points or anything. Um, so the career history is really important. What I recommend doing is having the following things. Um, the job title, which I'll come back to in a second. The job title is really important. Um, the uh, company name that you worked at, um, the dates that you worked there, and sometimes the location as well. Uh, I mean, the location can be worth putting on there. It, it depends. If, you've, if you're coming from abroad, um, sometimes, you know, if, if someone's come over from a different country, employers might, may see that as a, a negative rather than a positive. So sometimes I suggest leaving out the location of the company uh, it, you know, if that's the case, and I think it could be a, seen as a negative, uh, not always the case. Uh, so, yeah, the, 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 the job title, the company name, the dates and the location. And then a if it's the chronological CV, a series of bullet points as to what you did in that job. Uh, come on to more about that in a moment. Job titles aren't don't necessarily need to be fixed. Um, you know, just because you were called, um, you know, um, a track. Um, I, I don't know, um, just because because you were called an unusual job title in your last job that the employer came up with, you know, like a service content exploration manager or something unusual like that. It doesn't mean you have to stick to that. And actually, in a case where your um, your job title doesn't doesn't go with the rest of the industry, then I would suggest changing that job title to something that's going to sell you for the job you're applying for. Um, so, you know, if you're, for example, um, an experiential marketing um, analyst and you're but but you but that was your job title, but you actually ran the marketing department and you're applying for jobs as a marketing manager, then I'd probably suggest just calling yourself a marketing manager, because if you effectively ran the marketing for the company, then there's no reason why you can't put marketing manager. And don't forget, we go back to the same point again, if employers are spending um, a minute or less reading a CV, they very quickly want to see that you are a good match for the job. So by calling yourself an unusual job title, it, it's it's just going to get them pondering it and not really knowing what's going on. Um, so that's the first point. Um, the, the next point is when you write the bullet points, you know, I always suggest writing a duty or responsibility and then an outcome. So where possible, to, to not just to say what you did, but to say the successes of what you did. Um, and here's a few examples here. Um, so a good example of that is this, you know, the second one here is designed new website, increasing inquiries 30% year on year with a managed network of circa 30 overseas estate agents. Now it's not just telling you what, what the person did, it's telling you the success of what they did. So anyone can design a new website 
I, I could probably design a new website tomorrow using one of those free web design tools. doesn't mean it's going to be any good and anyone's going to visit that website. So it's not good enough just to say what you did. You have to also say the outcomes or the successes of what you did. Um, now, obviously, you're not going to be able to say that for all the bullet points in your whole CV, but certainly where possible, and certainly if you can, the top two or three bullet points, because they're the ones the employer is most likely to read and the most important ones, if you can put a good outcome, then I would recommend doing it. Um, now, the outcome can be something general. It can be a figure, a percentage. It could be the amount of money. It, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be in a certain format, um, but that's how I recommend doing that. Um, now, with the key skills in the functional skills CV, if we go right back to um, the job description here, what the, the idea behind doing that is that you can then focus on the main skills. So I would always recommend looking at the job advert, the job description or the person specification and, and underlining what you think are the main skills that the employer is looking for. And then when it comes to writing your functional skills CV, that you've then, you, you can then pick out the, the main skills and put that into your CV. That's how I'd recommend doing that. So in this in, in these examples here, we've got organization, administrative skills. So I'd imagine that would be on the job advert, management skills, communication skills, and technical skills. And, and putting in a clear and concise way what your skills are. And of course, the same applies. If you've got outcomes from what your duty or what your skills are, then I would always try and put the outcomes as well. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll do this last couple of slides, Souls and uh, Yael, and then and then we'll um, and then we'll come to any questions that have come up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's one more so far. So because because I think we're we're coming to the sort of the mm. the, the conclusion of the, uh, the end of the workshop, and then and then we can take any last questions that have come yeah. up. Um, so just a couple more points, and I think actually to be fair, I, I think I've covered most of this already. Um, if if in the job adverts they're using words like um, you know, team player or excellent interpersonal skills or um, attention to detail or good communication skills. If these are words that are appearing in the job advert or the job description, then you can cleverly write your CV to include words that imply that you've got those skills. So, for example, you know, if, if it's very important to them that they have a team player and you and you start using words like collaborated or liaised or coordinated, then you're you're implying that you are a team player because you are collaborating with people, you're liaising and coordinating with them. Um, likewise, if 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 it's if it's quite clear that it's, it's a prestigious uh, organisation, they're looking for high caliber graduates. If you start, you know, if you mention some of your your prizes and awards that you might have got at, at university or before, then then that then that's obviously going to stand you in good stead. Um, so that, that's that's the main point there. You can really cleverly word your CV to show them that you meet the skills that and experience that they're looking for. Um, so just before we close, um, and, and I'll take a couple more questions, um, just a checklist, really important. I think for those of you that were in Amanda Rubin's session, who's a recruiter, she actually mentioned that spelling and, you know, formatting and and grammar and all that kind of stuff is such a big factor um, the amount of times i've opened a cv that a client sent me and there's been a spelling mistake on the first line of the profile it, it, it's unbelievable it, it happens probably once a week twice a week um, it's a real big no-no because really your 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 first impression is that you that you haven't checked you know, your your CV for grammar, spelling, formatting, that sort of thing. I think it's really, really important that you do that, whether it's a functional skills CV or a chronological skill CV. Um, we mentioned the length of the CV, um, two, two pages max. Um, some people like to do, do one page. In fact, I, I'm so I'm told in America, whether you're the, the, the CEO of an organization or a cleaner, everyone has pretty much everyone has a one page CV. And I, I actually quite like that. So either a one or two page CV is, is what I would recommend. Um, contact details are, are obviously important, but don't go overboard. 
you know, some people I see in the contact details section, they put their date of birth, they put in their nationality, they put their marital status. They literally tell the, the employer their life history. Don't put any of that. It, it's, it, it could only go against you. Just stick to your email address, your phone number. And I actually really like to see someone's LinkedIn profile on there. So the URL as well, so, so that an employer can click on it and it, takes you, it should take you straight through to their LinkedIn page when the employer clicks on it. Because of course, then the employer's not only spending their less than a minute, they've clicked through to your LinkedIn and they're spending more time on your application, which is obviously what you want. Um, obviously, final, final cross check um, between the job description, the person specification and the CV. Um, but yeah, get a fresh pair of eyes to read through your CV. Um, I think it's it's really important. I don't know about all of you, but I never notice my own mistakes. I only notice other people's mistakes. And I, I think that's true for a lot of people. So get your, your friend or your sister or, or, or an employment advisor, one of us, to look through your CV before you start sending it out to everyone, because we'll probably notice something that you don't. Um, and yeah, last point there, keep a copy for interview preparation. Um, OK, so we've come to the end of the um, uh, for, to, to the end of the session. Um, there's one or two things I'll mention right at the end, but just before I do that, is there any questions, Yael? Yeah, there are a couple of questions. Uh, there's a quick one about the formatting. Would you suggest putting CVs into PDF format um, if organisations have different word packages and it might you know, look different when they open it? Does PDF yeah. keeps it quite uniform? Yeah, I would definitely recommend doing it in a PDF. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, the main reason is sometimes if, like, I think as inferred in the question, sometimes the the um, the employer might have a different version of Word, and therefore they open it up and it doesn't it, the formatting slightly changes. Whereas with a PDF, um, and by the way, it's very easy to save something as a PDF. If you're working on a Word document, um, you go to File, Save As, and then it gives you a list of options as to what you save it as, and you can uh, choose PDF. PDF should never change the format. You can't, it will, it, will, it will be opened exactly as you've saved it. So yeah, definitely definitely would recommend that. Mm. The, just one caveat is that in the, if you're working with recruiters, that's directly to employers, definitely. If yeah. you're working with recruiters to ask them, because I know Amanda said previously, she prefers Word, so she sometimes formats it for her employers. So you should obviously ask, but um, going to employers directly, um, yeah, PDF, definitely, as Richard suggested. Um, there's one more question. The question is, somebody who's been working as a freelancer the last couple of years and now wants to go back to looking for um, a job, how should they present that information on their CV? Okay. Um, I would just simply say, uh, look, it's very, very common to be a freelancer these days. Um, I would just have, you know, in the career history section, you know, still have job title. So your job title would be freelancer. Well, it wouldn't be. It would be freelance whatever you've been doing. So if you've been doing marketing, then freelance marketing. Or if you've been doing project management, freelance project manager. Um, and obviously, you won't have a company name. Um, so you might put, and sometimes I quite like to see this, if you've worked for some good brands, then you might put underneath it where, where you would normally put the company name. You could put working for companies such as you know, Nike, Adidas, um, whoever, whoever the names of the companies that you've been working for, um, and then the dates, and then, a, and then a series of bullet points as to what you've been doing as a freelancer. Okay, so that, that's how I would do it. I just treat it like a, a regular job. Great, thanks. Okay, all that's right. All um, questions. That's all the questions. Okay, so just the, the last couple of things to mention. Um, if you... Um, really, you should you, you, sh you should speak if you know to, to be as precise and, and get your CV looking as good as possible. You should run it past an employment advisor, one of us here. So um, if you want to, you're very, very happy to send us your updated CV, uh, make an appointment with an advisor to, to discuss your CV through with them. It, it, you know, they, they, by the way, I could talk about CVs all day. I mean, they, they, it's a, it, it's often very much a case by case basis. I've only mentioned the main points here. But if you want to discuss it with an advisor, your, your specific situation, then that's probably what I'd recommend doing. Um, you know, and of course, you know, all the other things, building networks, exploring other channels, 
and come to some more of our workshops on, on, on these type of things will, will massively help you. Um, and, and you've got there at the bottom, if, if, I'll just give you a minute or so, you can take down our email addresses there. Um, there's your L's, there's myself and, and the other members of the team there. We'll just, we'll just leave this page up for a few seconds so you can do that. Um, maybe, uh, you know, <laughs> Just, just as a caveat, if I suddenly get 80 emails with CVs on, it might take me a while to get back to some of you. So feel, feel free to, um, if you do want someone to look at your CV, um, I probably recommend an appointment if you haven't had one before. But if you are, if you are going to send them through, just bear in mind that we might have quite a few to look at. So um, it might just take a little bit of time to do that. Uh, just one more thing: we are running our next CV workshop thing next week which also includes cover letters um, and job searching so if anyone wants to join that will also be on zoom um you can sign up on our website free to attend yeah and th this was an hour long this session but that goes into a bit more detail that's two and a half hours so it's, it's quite a bit more detail on uh, expanding on some of the points we've been talking about and going through examples and that sort of thing mm -hmm. okay um well, thank you all very much for coming along to my session. It's very much appreciated. Um, I hope you've learned something from this and, and will use it and apply these tools to your own CV um, and enjoy the rest of the, 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 the sessions. Yeah, great. Thank you, everybody. So, so we'll have a five, five minute break now. Five and then you... minute break and then you should have the links for the next ones um, that are starting at, I think, 12. Okay, thanks. Okay. All the best.